got quite a crowd this morning. I'm happy to see that. I'm glad we're going to be enjoying our picnic together later. Kids have to play a little bit of music for you and everything. And, and uh, uh, if you want to go ahead and open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 15, we have we have a main story today where a woman gets a demon cast out of her and then there's a resulting jailbreak. And I love that story. I thought about just focusing on that. But before we get into that, there's some smaller stories about how they got to that point. And as I was looking at this, you know, uh, two men have a disagreement about how to do the ministry. And then God says, don't go into this place that looks like it is ripe for ministry. Uh, I want you to not go there. But then God doesn't say exactly, well, what do you want us to do in the meantime? And then finally they get a call. And God has his hand through all of it. God has his hand on it. And it's so difficult sometimes to trust the Lord. You know, we forget that God is all powerful and, and, and we we either think that he's so all powerful that he doesn't care what happens to me or we think that, you know, God is so narrow minded that he's must probably not really in charge. There's all these other great big forces in the world at work. And so maybe he's not powerful enough to stand up to them. I don't know. We either get God too personal or we get him too big and too far away. But I want you to know today that God is big, powerful, stronger than anything you can or cannot see. Uh, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And we can trust in him and, and uh, all the big forces in the world. It may seem like God and the forces of good are powerless against them, but we must learn to trust in the Lord that he has something going on. Not just because it makes us feel better, but because he promises that this is so. Ultimately, evil will be defeated. Good will triumph. The Lord will triumph over it all. The evildoer will be punished and we will be rewarded for the patience and the endurance that we showed through this time. And sometimes we got to go through really bad things. God tells us in the New Testament that I've not given you a trial that you can't stand. But even when I do, I give you a way to escape it. Now, I remember that's a memory verse from when I was a teenager. I can't tell you where it is right now. I didn't plan on sharing it, but it is there in one of those books that starts with C, 1st or 2nd Corinthians, maybe Colossians, something like that. You have my permission to read all three books later and find it for me. All right. Now, in Acts chapter 15, we're going to pick up where uh, we left off last time, they had a debate over doctrine. Does Jesus fully save you, or do we need to command all of the Gentiles to go ahead and be circumcised? And I hope I hope I did an okay job last Sunday about that, talking about salvation and talking about how some things are worth fighting for and fighting over, and we some things are so important that we must get them right, and that is definitely at the very heart of salvation. Uh, but there are other conflicts in ministry, and we're going to see the Apostle Paul. Now, keep in mind, the Apostle Paul looms large in our minds as we read the Bible. Uh, he writes so many letters that turn into books of the Bible. He is like the main theologian for the New Testament, and he wasn't even one of the original 12 apostles. And so I've been trying to hammer that home. Here comes a guy along later who was persecuting the church of God. He was an enemy of God in the worst way. And yet God uses him to reach the nations. And if you're waiting around for God to do something amazing through me, his servant, perhaps you should be waiting on God to do something amazing through you because uh, I am just as saved as you are by the grace of God. Having your sins totally forgiving and trading places with Jesus so that you have his righteousness and he takes your sin and that sin dies with him on the cross and he pays for it, that's, that is a state. There's no degrees of it. One person is not more saved than another. The pastor of a church is not more saved than any of his congregants. Peter, James, and John were not more saved than Paul or the many nameless people who we encounter in the book of Acts and throughout the history of the Bible. But 
God is more than willing to dwell inside each of his believers and do amazing things through them. Sure, God called me to a position where I am uh, work for the church and I'm in a position to do certain things that the average layman is not uh, able to do or not in a position to do. But the fact of the matter is God didn't raise up preachers. God raised up an army, every enlisted man, every Every grassroots member of the movement, we all are here to do something great for God. Paul and Barnabas have a little disagreement. Let's read this. Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 36. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Uh, let's pause right there and let's have a prayer. We, we, we're... I used to read the whole scripture I was going to preach on, and we may not get to all of it today because it's more than a chapter, but but uh, I, I used to like to pray after the scripture, so I've read some scripture. Let's go ahead and give this time of the word over to the Lord. Father, we thank you for all that you've given us, Lord, and I just pray that you'd help me explain what it's like to be in the ministry and uh, and, and how we are all in the ministry, and I just pray that you would set a fire in our hearts to represent you well, God. Uh, Lord, I lift up the ministry that we'll be doing today uh, as part of our picnic as we uh, want to have fun time and, and uh, bring in as many folks from the community as we can. But the other things that people have been suggesting lately now that uh, there seems to be a bit of a thaw in the COVID world and, and, and so we are less scared about getting out and inviting people to things, Lord, I just pray that you would help us, but help, help us to keep you at the center of it all. Lord, help, give us a heart to disciple people so that they may know you more and bring people to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so far, we've been doing everything for the first time. If you'll remember, the Holy Spirit fell and it was somewhat obvious to the apostles what they had to do then because they had the word of God inside of them and it was bursting. They had to let it out. And so they went out and they preached to the crowds, you crucified Jesus, but it was actually all part of the plan of God so that he would be sacrificed for the sins of the world. And the movement began. There were thousands of people saved that day. There were thousands of people saved at subsequent events. And day to day, the Lord was constantly adding to their number. And it reached a point where the authorities decided to crack down on it. And if you remember the people who believed in Jesus were scattered and they ran to other cities in other provinces. But just because they were scared enough to run does not mean they were scared enough to shut up. Okay. I want you to remember that sometimes it's smart to get out of Dodge, but there is nothing. There is no situation or circumstance that the Bible tells us it's okay to stop talking about Jesus. Oh, they won't like it. I better not say anything. And sure, there are moments where it's wise not to say something, but even fleeing persecution, it never entered the mind of Philip or Barnabas or anybody to say, you know what? We had it good in Jerusalem till we interrupted it with all this God talk. Let's just keep quiet here and maybe they'll leave us alone. Nope. Philip told everybody in the city of Samaria about it and, and, and other people were preaching everywhere they went. And it, the word came to Antioch up in Syria and, and they had a really strong church going there. Barnabas went and even found Saul after he had been converted and he had gone home. He was under persecution too. And he said, Saul, you're a good teacher. You know the Bible. We need your help over here in Antioch. So Saul was recruited to go over and teach everyone. And, and, and we don't pay enough attention to this. I think some of us have this mindset that church is church. Church has always been there. My grandma or my parents took me every Sunday and church is church. And, and maybe we don't have in our minds the maintenance it takes. The maintenance it takes to maintain the believers in the Lord. I know that I don't. I was raised in a pastor's home and... Uh, who came by when we needed pastoral help? Well, I think people assumed we could handle it ourselves. And at other times, it was other ministers. My mother's here worshiping with us today. I remember sometimes we'd hold a revival. And part of the best part of the revival was some other preacher would come in to preach at the revival and he'd spend time at our house. And I would witness my mother and father unloading on this guy. 
uh, and finally having an ear to listen about all the frustrations and things of ministry. So sometimes if I forget that you need encouraged and sometimes I forget that there is maintenance to be done on the relationship that I have with you, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, but I really have come to the conclusion that part of it is being a preacher's kid. You know, who came up, when did I ever see this uh, modeled for me? You know, that someone cared me about me in my time of need. So I'm working on that. I'm working on that. But Paul, Paul is very keenly aware. And he, he uh, Barnabas says, man, we got all these new believers. Now me, I would have said, God is moving. God is moving. We can't stop God. And so let's just let it go wherever it goes. But Barnabas says, no, we need a good Bible teacher. This thing could go off the rails at any moment. And the Lord has laid on my heart lately about discipleship and teaching and, and being sure that, and I keep asking God, okay, you keep telling me discipleship is important. Discipleship is important. We need to train our people. They need to know what it is we believe. They, got, they want to know what's expected of them because, you know, so far preachers just told us we need to show up on church and hold this pew down and keep it from floating away. You know, what else do we do? And, and. I want to train you guys this, but I keep asking God, okay, God, lead me to the program. Lead me to the program that will disciple our people. God, where is this program? And, and everyone's offering a program. You know, if you do this for your people, uh, your people will finally understand everything. They'll learn the Bible the best in this program. Or, and of course, I'm heavily involved in the WMU and RAs. And if we just, if we just have this program where they will, um, uh, we encourage our young people to come up with what missions they want to do and how they want to reach out to the community, turn them into leaders, and that all of that is great. But finally, I realized why God was not singling out any one program in my mind for us to really charge into. And that reason is because as a pastor of a church, God needs to change all of our hearts, starting with me, about what church is. And if everything we do is aimed at what we call discipleship or just teaching people what it means to live as Christians, and then our whole church, God is telling me that our whole church needs to be about teaching and telling people if they already know the Lord, how to live as a Christian. And also those who don't know the Lord, there's nothing wrong with showing them and telling them about how we live as Christians because we live differently. We live differently. And maybe our five-step uh, explanation of what the gospel is, maybe they'll hear that, maybe they'll understand it and everything, but they also need to see that we are different. And that when Jesus said, love your enemies, they need to see us love an enemy. And when Jesus said, uh, you know, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And they see that we begin to care less about our own good and, our, and we begin to think of ourselves not less about, uh, we don't think less of ourselves. We just think about ourselves less, as C.S. Lewis said. And, and we think about others more and we really genuinely are. Everyone is always saying about how we need to be good and kind and nice. But when they see that we really are and we're not bearing animosity to people who are not like us politically or not like us in other things over here. When people begin to see that we are different, uh, maybe there isn't so much of a difference between discipleship and evangelism after all. Perhaps people needed to be discipled to a point to where they are ready to accept Jesus and ask Jesus to come into their hearts, and that's evangelism. Evangelism being the term for just sharing Jesus and getting people to that point where they're ready to accept Jesus. But my sermons need to be disciple-making. I need to explain from the pulpit, and once a week isn't going to do most people any good. How many of you go out, go home tonight and eat lunch, and you've already forgotten everything I said? Doesn't hurt my feelings. That's just how it goes, okay? That's just how it goes. But, but what if our Sunday school and our RAs and our GAs and our CAs and, and everything else, we've got to change our mindset because what do we do right now? Well, we try to put on a show and we hope if we're popular enough, everybody will come. But that other church is more popular than we are. So we're competing with each other when we're supposed to be reaching 
the world with the gospel. And in order to get out of that mindset, we, I, I, had a, I had a pastor friend tell me a couple weeks ago, we have got to quit competing with each other as churches. And I just laughed and smiled and thought to myself, well, if you've got that all-encompassing solution, you just go right ahead, brother. I see it as a mountain, insurpassable. And, and, you know, we just, and the reason is because we think about church in such a way that we're never going to be able to get away from competing with each other. And I'm glad he said something because I began, been thinking about that for several weeks now. And then, you know, God's been telling me all about discipleship for a year and a half to two years. And all of a sudden the two came together in my mind. If we cared about whether everybody around us knows Jesus and is getting to know Jesus better, whether we evangelize them so that they can know Jesus and disciple them so that they can know Jesus better, if we care about that and someone comes to us and says, well, I've been thinking about going to this other church, instead of saying, oh no, don't go to that other church. We got stuff here. Come on, don't you like us here? We'll say things like, now, do you really want do you, do you really think that they have got what you need? Because if they do, then yes, you need to go there. And we will send you there. And we are glad you are going there. And, 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 and I'm just trying to get around, across a mental state. And, and, and the leadership of this church and that church can meet and say, you know what? There's a big gaping hole in our community. Your church is good at this. Our church is good at that. But what about this community here? And instead of competing with each other, they work together to either bring in staff or bring in a whole new church plant that deals with that idea right there. And we are all we all work together. We care about whether or not the people of the Holden area are meeting Jesus and loving Jesus. And we care about whether or not the people of Johnson County are meeting Jesus and loving Jesus. And it's not about who can grow uh, the biggest church budget. And it's not about who will have the most rear ends in the pews it is about are we focused on whether or not people know jesus and we won't be focused on putting on the best show so that the most people will come we will care about whether they really know jesus in their hearts in fact paul that was that's that's all that's my sermon on one verse it's gonna be long we're not gonna it's a good thing there's food here we're gonna need it when i'm done uh, but anyways, let us visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of God. Paul knew that people, even though they are held eternally in the hand of God and they cannot lose their salvation and that the Holy Spirit does a far greater work inside of them than we will ever do, Paul understood that people need leadership and maintenance and that even though they had commended those churches that they had planted to God, it was God's will for them to return, encourage, teach, instruct, be with those churches. Now, unfortunately, we see that there's some disagreement here. Verse 37, now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas. And departed. And so we have this thing here. Paul and Barnabas were the, the duo. They were Batman and Robin. They were the Lone Ranger and Tano. They went on the first missionary journey recorded in the Bible. Instead of fleeing to another city out of fear and then also having to tell them the gospel, what if we intentionally traveled to other cities and told people about Jesus? And so Paul and Barnabas went, and they it was good. Barnabas's younger cousin John, whose Roman name was Mark. He abandoned them at one point and they decide we need to go back and we need to uh, make sure these churches are doing okay. And Barnabas says, that's a great idea. I'm going to call John. And Paul goes, what? No, he's out. He wanted out. And so he's out. I've heard people talk about how unforgiving and terrible and mean Paul is. And he's unforgiving towards John Mark. And, and so uh, this just goes to show that there's so many things that Paul says that we don't like, that we don't have to listen to because he's a meanie anyways. I'm not here to teach you that today, okay? Now, maybe I'm a meanie too. And if someone had said, let's call Mark, I would say, forget it. He's already ruined it with me. 
I don't want to call him. In fact, I think, you know what? You put your hand to the plow and look back. You're not fit for the kingdom of God, just like our master said. They made up. Don't worry. There are, in Paul's letters, uh, he does mention John Mark and how good he's doing and how he's serving the Lord. And Paul and Barnabas decide that they have encountered a thing. It doesn't mean that Barnabas is working for the devil or that Paul is working for the devil. It just means that they're not going to work well together. Barnabas is adamant. John made a mistake, but he really has a good future in ministry. We want him along. And so he grabs him and they head back to Cyprus, the island where Barnabas was from. And Paul takes their first missionary journey, Cyprus and the mainland, and just kind of cuts out Cyprus because Barnabas and John are headed that way and they go to the mainland and he grabs Silas, one of the trusted men from the last story. Verse 40, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And so the world can see here that even though Paul and Barnabas cannot work together closely, neither one of them gets kicked out of the church. Neither one of them says, I never want to speak to you again. They just begin different ministries where Barnabas gets to do the ministry the way that he wants to or thinks the Lord is leading him in. And Paul gets to do the ministry in the way that he believes the Lord is leading him to do. And we have a multiplying of ministries. We have two leaders from the previous ministry going on to branch out and bring up more leaders. And that is an absolutely acceptable thing in the church of God. Verse 1 of the next chapter, Paul came also to Derbe and Lystra. A disciple there was named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. Now this is an interesting little story because they just had the big convention in Jerusalem with the apostles, with the guys who walked and talked with Jesus and learned directly from Jesus. And the decision is getting handed down. Gentiles do not have to be circumcised. Paul comes to Derby and Lystra, encounters the young man, Timothy, with a lot of promise. Number one, he's going to bring up more leaders. Silas is now drawn up into leadership. Now Timothy is being recruited. We're going to train you. You are a very promising young man. And I'm sorry, your pastor is not great in this area. And the book of Acts is showing me that we have got to be able to recruit leaders. If we want our church to grow. We need more leaders. And sometimes we pastors don't want to share the limelight. We might feel threatened. I like to think that I don't have that problem, but people do have their own ideas and we get more leaders. We're going to have more people with their own ideas, just like Barnabas and Paul. And sometimes, sometimes they're totally wrong because they didn't check it with the Bible. And sometimes it's just a thing. Well, okay, you need to go do what you need to do. Now I need to go do what I need to do. But in discipling, we can take people. Jesus can save people that already have some level of maturity, some level of leadership, and God can use them in the church. And it's very interesting that even though Paul is delivering the message, Cohen, that's enough. Uh, even though Paul is delivering the message that the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised, he takes Timothy and he says, you're Jewish, your mother is Jewish, your father was a Greek. People are not going to know whether or not they can trust you. So I'm going to go ahead, and even though it's not necessary for salvation, so that no one can say anything bad against you, because we need you in leadership, Timothy, we are going to go ahead and do this Jewish ritual in order to show everyone that you are on the side of the law of Moses and that you appreciate the law and the prophets and everything that came before and honor your Jewish heritage. But no, the Gentiles who are not connected to Hebrew, to the Jewishness, to Jewish society, we are not going to require them to be 
circumcised. If God wants to save them, who are we to stop God? So, and then, now I hope you see that this is just a bunch of little things that you run into ministry all the time. Disagreements. How do we handle this leadership thing? What are we, can we do that we don't necessarily have to do, but maybe it would help in setting this guy up for a future in ministry. And then there's the leading of the Lord, which everything should be done under the leading of the Lord. Verse six, and they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Now, I probably mentioned to you many times that what we call Turkey now, that peninsula was Asia Minor, but actually there was Asia was a province within Turkey. So you've got all these other Roman provinces and they're moving through them, Galatia and Phrygia, and, and there are lots of big cities in Asia. And around the coast, as you go around to the southern side of Turkey, up to modern day Turkey, and there you've got this province of Asia, there's that crown jewel city of Ephesus, big port city. And you can just see Paul licking his lips. There's a lot of people there that need to know Jesus. And if you remember your books of the Bible, there is a letter to the Ephesians. So apparently it does come there eventually, but God said no. And this is what I was talking about earlier, that when God says no to some, or maybe he's just saying, wait, God has a plan. We have got to trust the Lord that he has a plan in mind and that we can trust him to have the right plan, even though it doesn't measure up to our plan. And verse seven, but when they had come up to Mycenae, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mycenae, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, on your modern day map, there is a nation of Macedonia, but that's actually too far north. If you look at the nation of Greece, that northern part of the modern, not modern nation of Greece, that's where Alexander the Great and his, his father, Philip II, came from. And it's just across the water from the port city of Troy that they are at in Turkey, in modern day Turkey. It's just across the water there. And God has been forbidding them to travel here and here and here. And then suddenly Saul sees a vision in one of his dreams. Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, I bring, I, I'm making a big deal out of this because I want you to remember everything that happens after this would not have happened if they had not heard the Macedonian call from God and gone over to Macedonia. These are the incredible stories that happened because they went where God told them to go. Verse 11, so setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, the city named after Philip II, Alexander the Great's father, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the work, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. And so they come to the city of Philippi, knowing that it is the foremost city of the district. And they go out and they find a place by the river where people who worship the one true God spend time in prayer on the Sabbath. And they go out there on the Sabbath. And sure enough, they encounter people. Are they Jews? Are they having a synagogue there? The scripture is not really clear, but they worship the one true God. Perhaps they have encountered Judaism somehow. Perhaps some of them are Jews and some of them are interested Gentiles. And Paul does what he does in every city. He goes to the local group of Jews and he preaches that the Messiah has come. And especially one lady named Lydia, it stirs in her heart. And she not only accepts Jesus, but she puts them up for the night and probably for many more nights, wanting them to tell her city about 
Jesus. And then she would not hear the message if they had not obeyed God and came to Macedonia. Verse 16, things get interesting. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept saying for many days, Paul having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. I want to impress upon you that if we are going to be biblical, we must believe in miracles and we must ask God for miracles because the enemy is out there and the enemy is roaring uh, like a lion seeking whom he may devour. And we are in the enemy's territory and we are threatening the enemy's territory. So of course he is going to react and this whole world is in rebellion against God and they don't want to hear about God and they don't want to hear about Jesus. They don't want to hear about righteousness and the wrath to come. They don't want to hear any of that. We are a very threatening presence. And this is an interesting story because she's basically following them around for days saying, everyone, listen, this guy is telling you the way of salvation. She is approving of it. She sounds probably at first like she's helping and that's why they let her do it for several days before it somehow, for some reason, it becomes apparent that she is actually on the other team. Now, this poor girl is a slave. Whatever demon is oppressing her with these visions and things that seem to come true, she makes money for her owners by probably what was normal back in that day was to go into a frenzy and a trance and then say things, and that was taken as gospel truth, and you paid to get to talk to her. She's a slave. She's a slave not only to the men who are taking advantage of what a horrible state she's in, but she's a slave to this demon as well. And Paul, when Paul has finally had enough, and I feel that every time something like this happens, it is God's leading that says, you know, you have power over this, go take power over that. And Paul turns around, rebukes the evil spirit, tells him to come out, and she is no longer a slave to the unclean spirit. Verse 19, but when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Think about whatever medieval thing you've ever seen or heard of where their feet are in the stocks and they have been beaten in order to satisfy the crowd and they're going to figure out what to do with them later. Verse 25, at about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. What do you do in your lowest moment. Mental health issues are running rampant in our country. And I'm not going to tell you I got an easy fix that's spiritual. I'm going to tell you I have a spiritual solution. I'm not going to tell you I have an easy fix. You go to the doctor and the doctor says, take this pill. I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to say, don't take that pill. All right. You go to your counselor, you go to your doctor, you get all the help you can. But you also come to your church and you also open your Bible. And I feel that eventually, even though that medicine is going to help for a time, and I think you should let it help for a time, at some point, the spiritual issue at the root of it is really what you need to get a handle on. And even when we have spiritual issues we can't give a handle on, we have an almighty God and there ain't nothing he cannot get a handle on. And so we need to trust in the Lord. We need to feel safe and secure and not give in to anxiety. And what do you do when you are in any kind of prison? What is our example in the Bible to do when we are in any kind of prison? You need to pray and you need to sing. I firmly believe that that is the message of this story. You need to pray and you need to sing. 
And I don't know if the other prisoners wanted to hear Paul and Silas sing. I kind of think they were bored and they were happy anybody was singing. You know, I mean, you think it's going to be all rough and tumble, but, but for Pete's sakes, the loneliest people are in there. And they just want somebody to talk to or someone, someone's going to sing a song. What else were we doing, okay? So Paul and Silas are praying and singing. And the prisoners were listening to them. And I think that supports my, my theory. Verse 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. And good riddance, he locked up the apostle Paul. So we don't care if he kills himself, right? Verse 28, but Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then they brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Don't you love this? He's the jailer. He's in charge of them. And in the ancient world, if you're a jailer and someone escapes, you have to finish their sentence and you hope they didn't have a death sentence. And so he is scared to death. Something terrible is going to, he's going to have to suffer the sentences of all these terrible men combined. So he is ready to kill himself. Paul stops him. The man is so grateful. He can't believe that anyone would not take the opportunity to go running out of a prison. The moment that an earthquake knocked their stocks loose and the bars open and everything else like this. And he is moved in his heart and he asked them to tell him the word of the gospel. And it's so funny to me. He's the jailer, so he can just take them home. They're still under his care, right? And he takes them home and he washes their wounds and they get to share with the whole family. They've already been sharing with every prisoner in the prison. And now they're sharing with his whole family and everybody's baptized. And this is an amazing story that wouldn't have happened if they had not followed the leading of God. Allergies are out. Can't breathe through my nose. If they had not followed the leading of God, if they'd have gone where they had wanted to go and tried to do ministry for God in the power of their own strength, somewhere in the province of Asia, somewhere in Bithynia, somewhere that looked good to them. Instead, they followed the calling of God to go to Philippi. And God had all these amazing and terrible things waiting for them to do. Now that you've seen what ministry is like, who's ready to go minister? And some of you are probably smart enough to say, I know it's a cool story, but I don't want to live that. And to that, all I can say is life is tough. Life is tough. And we spend so much time trying to insulate ourselves from how tough life is. And then every once in a while, life comes to you and rips it all away. And life is tough again. And it's the same in the ministry. It's the same in church work. It is the same in trying to tell people about Jesus. It isn't that your life is so comfortable now and then with Jesus it won't be. It's that life is uncomfortable without Jesus and life is going to continue to be uncomfortable doing what God calls you to do but we know that at least we have a purpose and we have a God who loves us and we are eventually going, the worst thing they can do is kill us. And that means we're going to heaven. So it's a win-win on all sides. Wouldn't you rather your life mean something and you tell people about Jesus? Or would you rather stay falsely safe? Thinking that you're safe when you really are not. Paul and Silas are there 
to represent Jesus, and they probably did not enjoy getting beaten, and they probably did not enjoy prison, but they never took their eyes off the goal to represent Jesus. Verse 35, but when it was day, the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly. Uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And they, and do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates. And they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them and took them out and asked them to leave the city. So when they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. And so the jailer is imprisoning these men technically at his own house where he can feed them, care for them, wash their wounds from the beating. And he receives word that let those men go. We're not going to, it was the, to please the mob. That's all it was. Just, you know, get them to leave town and everything. Oh no. Paul was born into a fairly rich family. Not everyone born in America is a Roman citizen, uh, is an American citizen. Roman citizenry was something that only wealthy, important people were. And you were guaranteed, just like in America, we are guaranteed trial, uh, due process of law, uh, to face our accusers and all of those good things, Roman citizens were afforded the same thing. And they had violated that when they had beaten Paul and Silas without a trial. And I know that we are meek and mild Christians, and sometimes it's better to be wrong than to try to uh, drag everybody else through the mud, trying to get revenge and everything. But Paul has rights, and he stood up for his rights. And he... I think that he wanted the public to see that you can't just drag off Christians and beat them with no repercussions, especially when you're doing it to Roman citizens. So Saul, uh, Paul fully engages with the rights that he had in that society. And he demanded at least an apology from the magistrates. And he was granted the you know, they still wanted him to leave town and Paul's got other things to do. So he's going to leave town, but he goes back and he visits with Lydia and he go back, goes back and he visits with, and he visits the church and he wants to leave parting words of encouragement with them. And then it is on to the next thing that God has for them. All because God called them to Macedonia instead of where they wanted to go. Today, I want to ask you, believer, where is God calling you? And it might be down the street. It might be to work at a certain job over another one. It might, who knows what? Maybe, maybe you need to learn about how you talk to people. Maybe there's a way to be encouraging that you were not encouraging before. Maybe there is some way to represent Jesus to people that you hadn't been thinking about before. But I hope that you are engaging the Lord every day or at least every week to hear from God about what he is calling you to be and what he is calling you to do. Because for all the important things we are doing in our lives, he is the creator and he is the one who is over all and working for him is the most important thing. And we won't all go into vocational ministry like I have. We won't all be professional missionaries, but we will stand up for Jesus. And there's coming a day when you're going to have to make a stand and, and, and the Lord wants to know and he wants the world to know whether or not you really are on the side of the Lord. And you're going to have the opportunity to prove that. Nobody could question where Paul and Silas stood. Nobody could even question where Barnabas and John Mark stood. John Mark comes back into the ministry and proves, you know, I quit once, but I'm not going to do that no more. And we have the opportunity to prove to the world who it is that we worship and what our lives center on. If you'll go ahead and stand, please, we offer you a time to reflect on the sermon preached and, uh, if anything has moved you, if you'd like to come forward and share anything with the church, or if you'd like to come forward and say, I don't, I don't know Jesus. Paul and Silas had this deep burning passion in their lives. I don't have that. I don't, I don't know why God, what are you talking about knowing God and all that? We want to tell you all about it. We want to guide you into asking God to forgive you of your sins and come into your life and dwell within you. You can become a child of God and not just someone who knows about God. Won't you give in to that call today? 
Won't you come forward and let us help you with that today? And then you can tell the world that now you follow Jesus. Come